Oh wow, that was uh that was fast. We are live as as we speak. Boom. Here we are. All right. It's been a hot minute since we've done a full a full live stream. Yeah, yeah. Things have uh, certainly caught up, huh? Yeah. I mean, uh as everybody will know, just from the sheer fact of asking where certain videos are or where certain sessions were, blah, 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 we've talked about for a while. It's been a busy season. Yeah, so we have, we still have a lot of stuff that has been filmed that we are still in the process of basically pushing through the post-production machine. The grinder, as we would like to call it. Uh, but at the same time, I think... Oh, I, mean, I mess this one up. I think that's perfect. Right? I think, I think as, we're, as we're kind of at the year end, uh, we sort of wanted to kind of look back at what we've done so far. What were some of the fun episodes that we worked on? What were some of the agonizing episodes that we've worked on? Uh, what we have that we haven't pushed out yet, but maybe some patrons know, but that's that's <laughs> it. Um, but then at the end of the day, as the title for this Q&A suggests, <laughs> why do you miss? Why do we miss? Is yep. it because we suck? I mean, in some cases, I mean, I just, there are elements that would make you suck a lot more. And I'm more than happy to talk about it, which is, you know, also explaining why we have some rifles in queue for a second run. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, did I, I mean, get well, that? that? Yeah, I mean, that that question, it came from actually from the Patreon group uh, or the Utreon, Utreon uh, group from uh, from Link. And it was something that we answered like sort of passively in the discord servers a while back, but it was something that we probably thought was worth exploring at a much greater level of detail, like really talking through the rationale, the rhyme and reason behind why on any given shot, we might have a miss uh, specifically like on the practical accuracy course. And it, beyond just like the base concepts of like, well, you didn't, put the rifle with the sights where you needed to like, yeah, co correct. Right. <laughs> but, but uh, really digging into like what causes misses where we see the highest frequency of misses coming from when we're running the, the PA course or the speedway course for that matter. And sort of where we generally attribute the difficulty in running those courses, like where, where we generally attribute the, the highest level of difficulty on those. I mean, I think for me, at least it's fair, fair for me that uh, I assess that the, the uh, speedway course is infinitely more difficult than the practical accuracy course. I mean, even though we know which target is coming up, even though we know that, right. And, you know, you would you would be able to expect uh, extrapolate that in a, in a in a real world designated a defensive designated marksman would have an even more difficult role because it's not just UKD, but it all it is also you don't know where the next target will will pop up. So outside of, you know, we are still working in a in a in a somewhat vacuum uh, environment because we still have wind, you know, we still have some, some of the temperature, some of the environmentals that would affect us. Um, but the factor of time, the pressure on the uh, of time that pushes on you amplifies some of those uh, difficulties when it comes to some weapon systems. And I think some of the comm block weapons, as we're pushing more and more stuff out, um, we do have comm block stuff lined up. Uh, have we? I don't think we've gone through the discussion on some of them yet, have we? Mm, but not, yeah, uh, this, yeah, yeah, no, no, not yet. I mean, are you comfortable with me kind of revealing a few that sure, a few comm block weapons it. that we've so, so, so we've got the, the AK 
the AK Alpha, AK74 Alpha, the Spetsnaz clone that Josh has, basically the Zenicode out, SLR 104FR. So you've got a factory Arsenal Circle 10 TDP built AK74, AKS74 with a full Zenico kit on it. Uh, that one shot the uh, Speedway course. And then we've got the VZ58 shooting it with the ACSS 3X Micro. Um, and then the M76, the Yugo M76 with 8mm Mauser actually did shoot the course. And then finally the PSL has shot the Speedway course already. Yes. Oh. And those, yes. all of those have a varying degree of difficulty to them. Uh, that is that is very apparent when it comes to com block weapons. But at the same time, when the Kalashnikov was developed, remember the primary mode of operation for the Kalashnikov is full auto. Mm -hmm. That is your next selector's position is auto and then semi. And you know that's a deliberate thing. So the type of point accuracy that some of the NATO rifles do deliver that may not be the primary um, consideration for some of the com block rifles, but <laughs> I will say in the case of the M76 and the PSL, technically those are supposed to be used as DMRs and supposed to be used for point targets, mm -hmm. but they suffer from their own little demons themselves. Yes. Well, so so let's let's take a little bit more of like a, a breakdown approach of that that initial question of of where and why we think misses take place uh, based on the experience we've had. And let me start by asking you, how much do you believe mechanical accuracy of the rifle is in terms of a factor? How often are we shooting a rifle that just can't really make it to the end of the 500 yard course or 450 meter course. Okay. So the targets that we're shooting at are basically sub C zone targets. So mm -hmm. smaller IPSC targets. And you're looking at what? Eight by 10. Is that, does that sound right? Uh, we, or eight we, by 12. We, yeah. Ish. Yeah. Uh, so let's say you're, you're looking at, at 500 yards an eight inch target, for you to get 100% in that cone of fire, you really want that, you know, an eight inch diameter circular cone of fire. And you're basically looking at 1.6 MOA. So if you're shooting 1.6 inches consistently, like nine for nine shots in that 1.6 inch circle, then you should be able to hit that 500 yard target if you are if you have your environmentals and, and bullet, uh, bullet drop and wind holds down. And so you'll see certainly some things help us eliminate uh, the guesswork of using bullet drop, right? You've got with old rifles, you have your tangent sights, your ballistic, your uh, bullet drop compensated rear sights that could elevate, you know, where you're aiming to compensate for it, but you, you need to match your projectiles to it. So you need to use a service load for that rifle. Uh, but when you're talking about mechanic, like pure mechanical accuracy, a lot mm -hmm. of these rifles that we're shooting are three MOA rifles. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, but, but even a three MOA rifle right out at 500 is still hitting within like a 15 ish inch it's, circle. It, right. So yeah. assuming assuming the target is, you know, I, granted, like I think eight inches is a little tight. I think it's more like a ten by ten or or so. I mean, it's not a square, right? But it's more yeah. more in the realm of like a ten to twelve inch target um, than an eight. Big. Yeah, that's about this big, I think. Mm -hmm. So assuming that that's the case, like what we know is that most of the rifles, whether most of the the service rifles generally are you know between two and three inch guns generally speaking some lean closer to three some lean closer to to maybe even a little under two potentially but most of them are in that bucket so when we look at whether or not that is sufficient 
approximately speaking, we're shooting the same size targets out all the way. That usually gets us out to 400, maybe even 450 before we're even really having to worry about mechanical accuracy at all coming into play. And then, okay, maybe a little bit, 450, 500, it comes into play. But with the Express, like aside from an Express few setups, i.e. the crank off, that are just horrifically outside that realm of standard two to three inch guns. Wouldn't you say that like mechanical accuracy is generally there like for pretty much most of what yeah. we're doing? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down a lot of it comes down to the shooter, how familiar they are um, with shooting at distance. Yeah. Okay. Um, we'll get, we'll get there. We'll get there. What? We'll but I would say the environmental has has a lot to do with it. And I'm not just talking about your wind. Yeah, we know the, the bullet has to be shot up and then it arcs down. So you have your bullet drop. You have to fight gravity. And then you also have your wind blowing. So you have to compensate for wind drift. But then what I was really also talking about is the shooter's condition under certain environmental constraints and or... Uh, body position, uh, the circumstances that they can be shooting the rifle. Uh, you know, are they are they torqued up in a re in a weird position, or are they ideally proned out to where they are as stable as they can get? Um, or do they have a giant magazine on the bottom, like a Kalashnikov magazine that 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 prevents you from getting a good rest on um, on the uh, shooting bag? And even if you can, then you have to torque. Then your shoulders, you have to bump your shoulders up to compensate for that long magazine that's sticking down from a Kalashnikov. I mean, so I think a lot of, uh, you know, like mechanical accuracy is just one piece of the puzzle. You know, a lot of well, guys would right. like to, a lot of guys would like to say, well, you know, the rifle is mechanically capable of doing that. Yep. Roger, got it. You know, I'm not going to take a ransom rest to every single location I go to and dial it in like it's a field artillery piece, right? So, you know, you have to also look at the circumstances and, and the conditions that you're in. And some of those conditions, let's say hot weather, I'd say has, at the very beginning, uh, Josh, I, I know the audience probably doesn't see this, but at the very beginning of practical accuracy, we would go out and, and, and push eight to 10 rifles in a session. I mean, that sounds like a fun day to most people, but we were also in Texas in the summertime outdoors under my little army poncho that I had uh, rigged up as some sort of a top cover with bungee, uh, little bungee slings on the side. I, I, I built an observation hooch. Uh, not a very good one at that because it's not camouflaged, but in 90 to 100 degrees, basically, we're there uh, shooting dehydrated, super hot. Uh, and it's kind of funny. Your mind works slower, I think. You you know, I, I feel like looking back at some of those targets, I think I had, even though we shot the course a lot, sometimes I would get confused on whether I'm shooting at the right target. Mm-hmm because of how hot it was and and you know like some of the some of the uh sessions like the the k2 i, I the k2 the m4 like we were out there baking all day specifically because we thought oh these are going to be the easy rifles let's work on the com block rifles first and so we get all the com block rifles run through first thing in the morning when it's still cool and by the way they had a hammer down at 9 a.m policy so you basically burn two hours of daylight just sitting around doing nothing even if you're there at seven. And so all that combines, you get, you know, your mind is just kind of going and, you know, turning into fruit loops. All right. So that, that brings up another potential reason like for, for the missing, right? So basically we're both in agreement that mechanical accuracy, probably not the root cause of missing targets, unless there's like a very specific set of circumstances. So within the scope of the other, sort of buckets of potential options. You've listed out a few. The shooter error is one that probably does 
cause misses from time to time. And we're not talking about where you misread the wind, for example. We're saying like where you make a concerted mistake on what the hold is, how how you're squeezing the trigger, like jank, you know, yanking or janking on the shot, like not being clear about where you should be holding on a certain target or at a certain distance, things of that nature, just for whatever reason, you, you miss it up in your head. Right. Like I know that I've done that on some of the shit, like some of the runs I've done. I remember specifically on the M16 A4 with ACOG video that we did like way back when in the day, there was mm -hmm. a shot at 500 where I knew the second I pressed the trigger before I even saw where the impact was, I was like, Oh yeah, like I, I loose that way too soon. And yeah. I wasn't ready for where, you know, for where it was going to go. So where do you think like shooter error stacks up into the list of potential mistakes? Probably one every one, maybe one every four or five runs where you'll be like, oh crap. Yeah. Like that was totally a bad shot on my part. So would there have been runs uh, where shooter error has come into play? I think uh, you were talking about the A4 um the martini henry i like absolutely shot at the wrong target because i was just i mean there was a That's lot going on through my rifle. mind right it's not it, it for the era the martini henry was cutting edge josh for the 1870s but mm. uh but the here's here's the funny thing right now that we're used to shooting modern rifles to fall back on something that we perceive as very rudimentary or, you know, just ancient, that turns into a complicated piece for us to work because I had to figure, I had to figure out, you know, what the black powder was doing to the bore condition and how to combat that, you know, whether I was pushing too much, too many cartridges down. Um, and at the same time, you know, with Rob explaining that one, the rifles were not designed for that type of point accuracy. So, so some of that requires us to relearn it. I mean, that's a, that's a knowledge base. So I guess that could also be swept into shooter error is if you don't have the knowledge base. Now, I, I will say this with the Soviet type rifles, the one cool thing is if you generally, if you use this like seven, six, two, three, nine, it doesn't mind if it, it doesn't matter if it's a VZ 58, a Chinese SKS, a Kalashnikov, uh, an AK 103, AK 105, AK 74, or even a Yugo AK. The systems are all the same. The leaf site all works the same. You, you bump it all the way back and it is your, um, it's your battle site for 300 meters and then you start bumping it up and it is your tangent site. So having some cool systems like that is interesting because that same doctrine translates through all these different systems. But then when you drop something that is hyper accurate, mechanically hyper accurate, like the Swiss K31 uh, and their sighting systems are different because you have your 100 and 200 is um, it is a uh, bullseye hold on your target. So where you, where you where you aim it is where you hit it. But then once you get to 300 meters, it turns into a six o'clock hold. So if I didn't know that, and that turns into a piece of shooter error in a sense that I didn't know that at 300 meters, it bumps the point of impact higher, I would have sailed rounds over the target every single time. And quite frankly, with... When we, you remember when we did the diopter K31? Mm -hmm. I didn't know how many di how many clicks to go to, to push it farther. Like that was purely using what people out there would call Kentucky windage to get all the way out as basically using a battle, a battle site zero at, well, I think we use, I used a 400 meter zero and then sailed over the last one at 500. Uh, yeah, I mean, shooter errors got a lot to do with it, but um, shooter knowledge, I would say, is also just as big a part of that as okay. shooter error. Right, okay, that makes sense. Like knowledge on the platform, knowledge of how to use the platform, not just necessarily fundamentals of making a good shot.
right? Not just mm-hmm. the shooting fundamentals, but actually fundamentals on given platforms and the experience you have on a given platform. There's a there's a comment that that showed up. I want to I want to bring this up too. Um, Toe juice, <laughs> lovely, nice. Uh, he's he's talking about he he does Norwegian target shooting, and that's Stangskitter. If have you seen Stang Stangskitter? Have mm-hmm. you seen that before? Yeah, it's like a super fast bolt action competition where mm-hmm. they shoot, I, I believe, one hundred to three hundred meter targets, um, and the crazy thing about it, you'll see these guys go out there with these ancient crags and they'll shoot against Norwegian military personnel using G3s, using iron sights, and they'll have to cycle their bolt and reload as quickly as possible and shoot these targets. And sometimes the civilian shooters will outshoot the military guys using the semi-auto. So it's, it's incredible watching that. And so when he's talking about, uh, he's the weirdest thing he's found out is making that was making him shoot worse was that he was trying to work the bolt too fast. So in this instance, and I know there's a lot of part of doing YouTube. I mean, part of it is, I mean, shall I destroy the magic a little bit and say that showmanship is a part of that? (laughs) You know, there's a certain skill level in being able to show a rifle off. Right. And if you're able to cycle the rifle hyper fast, we know a few influencers who are really good at that. Mojo is really fast. Like uh, his his movements are extremely fast. And he recently, Milspec Mojo, he yeah. recently got into bolt action mm-hmm. precision rifles too. Yeah. And he went from zero to like some of the fastest, slickest, you know, bolt throws I've seen out there. But if you're a shooter and you're getting into the bolt actions, <laughs> And before you're you're focusing on how the rifle shoots and, and how the rifle works at distance, your your singular focus is on the mechanical action of trying to make that cycle work. Uh, I mean, that could be something that throws you off because then in your mind, you're not thinking about, you know, how am I ballistically going to place this projectile on the range? You're already thinking about what about the next shot hmm. rather than the shot you're you're trying to take. And so... Yeah, the accuracy internationals I have are super slick, but I don't cycle them like they're Lee Enfields. Like they can be done that way, but I don't anymore. Um, no, I mean, on, as a default, I don't just try to slam all the bolts actions as fast as possible. Now, certain exceptions to it, your Lee Enfield needs to be handled like that to work right. That at least that's what I found. If you slowly pull the Lee Enfield bolt back, it, it, you have a potential of inducing like errors or rim jams or whatever. Uh, but I think I think you know, I don't know. Would that translate to short range shooting? That sometimes people are thinking too much about the movement rather than the actual marksmanship. Sure, it's, there's twofold. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a way to describe that. It's, you, so. The idea of like trying to hammer the trigger too quickly could translate into where you short stroke the trigger. Basically, you don't let it reset all the way. And so when you press the trigger, you just get a dead gun, like nothing happens. Uh, and that's something that when you're when you're trying to sort of press the edge on performance and over overdo what you can physically do on the gun, uh, you your finger can short stroke. Like, and I found that it's always better to shoot slightly slower on hammers by releasing a little bit further, even if I come off the trigger slightly before I re-engage and press. Um, I remember when I first got into shooting, somebody was giving me a lot of crap actually online because I had a slow motion video of me like doing a hammer drill basically or, or running a mag really fast. And my finger was coming off the trigger slightly uh, as I was pressing the trigger. They were saying something like, well, you, why you think you're so good, but you, you're you losing contact with the trigger. And the idea is you maintain contact with the trigger because you have the least wasted motion in the trigger press process. Okay. So you can theoretically, you can be faster if you keep your finger directly on the trigger during reset. The problem with that is if you ever mess up and you don't release all the way, then you get a dead gun and it basically makes the entire string like then you're, then you have you've wasted so much more time than the fractional milliseconds that you're losing by just coming off slightly as you repress. So that's one example. The other example is probably overdriving. 
So to the, the whole like being like looking like you're doing it really well, when you snap between targets, it's really common, especially even for me when I haven't done it in a while and I snap between one target to another, I'll overdrive the gun way past where the stopping point on the target needs to be. So yeah, I mean, I think that there's definitely connections with similar processes that you're describing where like you, you get the idea of I'm trying to do things fast to be, because I know I'm meant to do certain things fast. But in hindsight, like it, it has a detrimental effect as if you just took your foot off and went about 10% less, um, gives you a better, a better actual overall result. I think from, uh, from shooting pump shotguns, yeah, some guys, example. some guys, when they, when they try to ride the shotgun, so the way you do it, once you, once it recoils, you, you ride the, the, the pump back and cycle it. And then when you go back on target, you push it back, back forward. Uh, but I, it's hard to say, like, you have to, you have to work with a shotgun in order to, to make that work. Like you have to work with a recoil in order to be able to slide that s slide, the, the, the pump backwards all the way, and then go back forward on target. And I mean, that, that takes practice, but I've, I've seen guys when they, um, when they want to, basically they didn't have enough practice and they needed to perform in a match environment mm -hmm. and they just kept on short stroking the shotgun, the pump mm -hmm. shotgun. And that just ends up, they end up doing so much worse than the guy who was deliberately just, just being a that, little bit slower. Right. Yeah. Just basically dialing it back and making sure that their movements are good. But then they're also focusing on the, um, uh, the marksmanship, the, the core marksmanship aspect of shooting. Mm -hmm. All right. So that, that was an interesting, like sort of pivot or, or like sidebar on, on the point of like shooter skill and, and both knowledge and skill with the platform and just general fundamentals. So obviously those could have massive impacts on how well a run goes, right? They could. Yeah. Whether or not that we're like r routinely plagued by those on a practical accuracy run, I would say it's not particularly common for you. Like at least not now. Maybe when we first started, we were learning systems and we weren't as good mm -hmm. and we weren't as experienced, right? To, to use this exact language. And we probably fell victim to that in certain instances. Um, another I area where that's relevant is on spotting hits. Like, obviously, like when we started, I, I had zero experience spotting at all. We were on like a bad glass trying to look through a cell phone camera, like to see impacts. And it was basically impossible to do that. And I think that within at least effectively. So I think a lot of the times when we were doing that, you were reliant on being able to try to call the hits yourself. Uh, and I know you still do that. But you were you were trying to call the hits yourself, uh, whilst whilst I was trying to film. Basically, now we've got a little bit of a different setup where we have like an actual spotting setup where we have the 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 main camera. Then we have a separate spotting equipment setup, and we're really like trying to. I'm trying to follow um, the, the trace of the round out to the target and give like accurate calls on exactly where it's going. How much is that in your opinion, as the shooter listening to the calls, how much has that changed your ability to be effective? Do you think, or at all compared to, if you think back to a couple of years ago when we were doing it? Um, I think to 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 i think to to further to further um bring this to a bigger picture it's not just the spotting but understanding that we are working together to figure out what the, what the rifle's doing having the experience now working together on this is crucial with it cuz back then I, I i remember rifles that i think one of the one of the rifles that i really want to reshoot and we have it on the docket to reshoot as a K2 uh, because I remember that one, I was just, I mean, it was hot. My mind wasn't thinking right. I don't particularly remember that we were actually working to figure out what the cone of fire was. I don't think we were using the ideal ammunition for it. Um, it simply just was not a, 
a good comprehensive uh, observation on it because we weren't working as a team to identify if there were issues that we're facing. Fast forward recently, we shot the K1 recently. Absolutely bang the course for a single position site. I mean, that was a showstopper, the K1. It makes zero sense that the K1 outshoots the K2 because on a flat 100 meter paper course, the K2 shoots better than the K1 for sure. It has better sights that are ballistic, ballistically com uh, compensated as well. Um, I think one crucial thing there is that you're also able to say uh, to identify problems that that's that's going on in a sense that when I was shooting the K1. That there was that what you guys saw was a second go, but the first go, I mean, if we were to say like we did multiple goes, it wasn't really a multiple go. It was more so I shot target one, two, and Josh then says, "Hey, what are you doing? You don't usually shoot like this. You're trying to rush through this to get to some of the other rifles that we're working on, aren't you?" And Josh absolutely called my BS. And I said, you know what, Josh? Yes, you're right. I was just going off of this as a single position site. I was not actually applying my full mental capacity to doing this. And you're able to identify that problem outside of even like spotting. You're able to identify, hey, you know, pull, put your big boy pants on. Treat this like any other rifle that we that we run on this course. And let's go. And and I, I did. It took, it took a minute. You know, pause, look back at it. You're right. Let's do this. And then it, mm. we applied a lot of the things like we would apply to any other rifle with that, without any prejudgment of what the rifle could do. And it did well. So I think that, you know, us being able to work together in that capacity has been huge, absolutely huge. Yeah. I think that comes from time. Even though we, we have known each other for a very long time and we've shot together for a long time. This particular dynamic is a very interesting one when you're doing like shooter spotter setups and within the context of like review in general, like reviewing guns, quote unquote, or at least, I mean, I wouldn't really call what we do reviews, even though, you know, well, that's the name of the show, but it's, it's more so <laughs> simply like putting it, putting it through an actual course of fire and seeing how it, how it actually functions. Well, uh, I but, think it would be different if we had, a very similar background and it would be a lot more bland if we had similar backgrounds hmm. because there's, there's a lot of things like Josh, the only one firearm I've, I've been able to convince the only one classic firearm I've been able to convince Josh to get is a Beretta 22. And that's because the thing had some pretty rad history behind it. Like I've tried to get him to buy a Swedish Mauser, try to get him to get into the Mosin game the Finnish Mosin, some of these nicer classic rifles. Nah, he's just like, Henry, I'm just not interested in it. Uh, but at the same turn time... Turn the comments against me very quickly. Well, no, it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm also not... I also learn a lot from Josh like when it comes to... Because my knowledge in night vision does not come with shooting. I drove with night vision. I walked with night vision on. So I had to learn about how some of the shooting aspects of night vision worked because Josh likes that type of stuff. Uh, some of the aspects around surrounding glass. I'm a shooter. I don't nerd out on glass composition and I don't, I, I, I just, there's a lot of aspects that I just don't really look into when it comes to um, the, peripheral accessories and quite frankly when it comes to it using some of the attachments to its to aid in your shooting it's not that i didn't believe in it i just i was not as interested in it but some of those techniques absolutely help absolutely help i mean it's training your body how to work the rifle and, and basically training the software in your body and, and how to do that. And if we came from a similar background, like if you were a 2007, like surge era GWAT veteran, 
from a similar era that I was in. I don't, I mean, I think we'd be stuck in telling the world that, you know, quad rail gang rise up, you know, this is, this is the best thing ever still, you know, let's, you know, who cares about, who cares about some of the latest and greatest in night vision technology, even though I have some night vision to show everyone later on that will, that everyone will uh, enjoy. Um, <laughs> I, I think I think at the end of the day, having the two aspects really complement each other, and yeah, it's not okay. just it's not just like that mentality. Also, like coming down to short range training and and learning how the short range stuff also applies into um, uh, basically the fundamentals in transitioning between targets. Uh, how to use the best? How to how to make use of most of your equipment? Yeah. So why don't there, we do um, why don't we do super chats real quick and then we will continue on. All right, so it's uh, big red doggy recently acquired a Kiapa eighteen seventy four sharps. Ooh, nice in forty five seventy. Big boy, big boy. With a, yeah, with a vintage style six X scope. Interested in doing accuracy test? Absolutely. Um, now, Josh, you know I have always talks about wanting to see what the 4570 does in this aspect in two ways one in the traditional sharps 1874 especially with the um with the diopter sights mm -hmm. but also in the context of some of the modernized ones if you put a scope on a modernized 4570 what exactly is is the ballistics? Well, what I've heard is just absolutely terrible. <laughs> but at the same time, those modernized ones are what eighteen inch barrels. Mm, yeah. Whereas he's talking about a th thirty four inch barrel. Yeah. So you're getting a lot more burn onto the cartridge. Yep. Um, I I would imagine there's more stabilization as well. Um, yeah, would that would make sense, right? So I mean, bottom line, yeah, I'm I'm interested, but at the same time, I I kind of want one because what I've heard was that when you compare it to the Martini Henry, which is also a 45 caliber, um, 85 grain charged. I don't know 45 70. I think 45 70 is more like a hundred. Oh, 70 70 grain charge. Uh, yeah, the se 70 on the uh, behind it denotes the grainage of the black powder that, that charges mm. the projectile. So, yeah, 70 grain. So it's actually a lighter charge than the Martini Henry. But the Martini Henry, with the rifling and everything, is known to be less accurate than the 4570s. Of course, the 40 4570 was an American classic specifically designed because as Americans, even in the 1800s, you are obsessed with the type of accuracy as we are these days in shooting any type of firearm out there. So I, I need, shoot us, an, shoot us an email. I, I, I'm interested, but at the same time, I also have plans in buying one. So if we're going to have one, I don't necessarily want someone to risk their property um, in transit. Yeah. So, but send us an email. I'd like to learn about um, the 4570, uh, 1874 sharps that he has and, and seeing what he's seen so far. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. All right. So pivoting back to why we miss, we've talked about, I think, a, a few really good core. And just like that, he's gone and he's back. I wanted to show uh, a little sneak peek on my dual tubes. Oh yeah, I Henry have. did get a pair of dual tubes. It's true. I finally convinced him. It is the newest of Soviet technologies mounted onto a skateboard helmet. They call them bump helmets, Henry. It's okay, bump helmet. It's a skateboard helmet. I don't care what you say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> with your non with your non oscillating non pivoting non moving 1980s tech it is absolutely awesome <laughs> but I, I i'm trying to convince josh to do a night shoot so so i could show this off to the world so yeah. everybody oh wow people are already saying like 
WTF and all that about it. It's actually the the nods themselves were actually sourced from Ukraine. Um, at pre-war, you know, I, I got it from Ukraine. So um, <laughs> not sure of the actual, you know, the actual history of it. Uh, but basically they rigged the set of Soviet PNV 57 echoes to run on nine volt batteries. I'm guessing they use it as observation, which is fine because as long as you have an infrared detecting technology, if the other side does use infrared floods or lasers, you absolutely can see them. So that is already a leg up from uh, using your naked eye. Um, so maybe they just use it as observations. But what I did, I actually rigged it to run off of airsoft batteries and I could plug it into my Jeep and drive around with, <laughs> with my ancient Soviet nods. <laughs> so more on that, more on that. You just, you guys out there, please convince Josh to donate one of his evenings and we can document it for science. So as I was saying on the subject of why we miss targets, Henry, what um we we talked about a bunch of good ones so far one of the ones that you brought up like right at the very beginning uh is wind uh-huh and the ch specifically changing winds right gusting winds or changing winds yeah if we look at that in a vacuum we know that wind specifically on the service rifle course where a huge number of the rounds that we're shooting are not like high grade match projectiles. A lot of them are ball ammunition. They don't have the best BC. Uh, <laughs> they don't have the best BC. What? You know, what, what's your take on it? I mean, the winds here in Texas, and it's probably anywhere to be, to be honest, but they, we can go anywhere from five mile an hour to 15 or from 10 to 20 or from 15 to 25 on a given day. And it could be within the span of a couple seconds between shots that you have a massive shift in your wind. I know that that impacts us quite a bit on the range. I know that there is there's quite a bit of it uh, of effect that that can have in the realm of multiple targets of deviation around along a horizontal plane. I mean, where, where would you rank that in terms of reasons that you might have a miss it, for me? I think that that's right at the top. I think gauging and judging wind and the, the like oscillation or changes in wind pattern is extremely important and also very hard to do when you're shooting those ball projectiles. Yeah, I think, so there's, there's, um, there's two factors that typically you would use to mitigate. Well, not really two. There's two big factors that you would take typically use to mitigate some of the wind. You know, one is selecting a caliber, uh, that tends to ride the wind better. And by that we were thinking either the bullet shape, accommodates it better the the cartridge runs faster uh, in velocity uh, so it gets less it's it's in the air for less time and it gets affected by the wind less um, or or I mean I, the mechanical accuracy is also another thing so if you're taking all these into consideration some of the some of the most challenging cartridges to shoot during high winds, oscillating winds opposing winds um on the short on the shorter service course is probably the 76239 mm -hmm. uh, so then similar to that but not entirely similar to that um when you step it out at distance your 308 does suffer more than some of the other cartridges, but not, I, I think it's a little bit overblown because you get a lot of guys who only shoot 200 meters out there and saying that 308 is a horrible cartridge in the wind. I mean, the, 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 the wind drift and bullet drop is not bad at five, six, even 700, let's say with ball ammunition. 
It's just not. Like at 800, you'll see ball ammunition suffer. But if you switch over to 175s, uh, you know, M118LR type loads, you're able to mitigate that issue and push it to 1100, no problem. Um, the other side that helps you with wind uh, is probably your sighting solution. So with iron sights, having a, um, a square front post to help you uh, uh, judge on how far you're, you're holding off as you push out. But then more so with glass, if you're using a reticle or some type of aiming system that has a reference uh, and giving you the wind holds that that absolutely helps. Like it's, so, so we talk about ACSS a lot. It's because I like it because I shoot in a lot of wind and a lot of distance and a lot of known distance or unknown distance ranges. With a lot of the environmentals, that is where the ACSS system shines, but not the ACSS CQB system because those CQB systems only have the bullet drops, and so that would make the wind judgments very difficult. So the 2X, <clears throat> I love them. But at the same time, if you're trying to shoot a 500-yard target and you only have the two drops going down, I mean, that is absolutely going to be more difficult than having the wind holds as you push out. But then at the end of the day, knowing how to string all this together is going to be the key. Mm -hmm. Basically, you know, the, the knowledge, the, the practice. Right. I'd also add that with the glass, shooting with an optic, I generally can see, at least here, where the, the heat in the mirage is so prevalent most of the year, it's a lot easier to perceive mirage through glass looking at what it's doing, even when it's not hot, for that matter. Just when the you can see it at, at those further ranges, five, six, seven hundred, 700, and you can really, if you're paying attention to it, you can catch the wind direction like visibly by how the mirage appears to be moving. Mm. So the mirage is a good thing to bring up because in the M24 video, we did have some issues dealing I remember with the that. mirage. Yeah. Uh, because, and, and that, that was something that we showed that we had a, um, a spotting error. Uh, but then I'm not trying to like blame Josh for everything. It's a team. It, it is a team thing, but you know, like for that particular one, we highlighted the difficulty of, you know, if you're not seeing the mirage, uh, the the mirage wind indicators, then you're unable to um, adjust to it. And I was unable to see it because I was seeing mirage in the scope already because mm. it was a particularly cold day. So I just assumed that that was mirage coming from the scope. Yeah, like coming uh, off the barrel, right? Yeah. Correct, correct. So even if not some of your rifles run hot the uh i love my sig the sg 55x series but those things run hot mm -hmm. and now shooting i love my brn 180 but that thing shoots hot and i'm saying like when i'm shooting it and i'm gripping it i can feel the heat hit my hands if i don't have the front end sealed up with the insulation panels uh from Slate Black Industries, of course. But uh, <laughs> but that heat most certainly does translate into something, and which is why, you know, in some of the more classic sniper rifles, you'll see them use mirage, bla mirage bands uh, to mitigate some of that factor off of the barrel. And suppressor covers. That's yeah. another thing that we've seen with a Mark 12 video, you know, seeing the, the effects of the... Uh, the AEM-5 is extremely effective, but at the same time, it just traps all that heat. And that heat just translates into Mirage if it's a low wind day. Mm -hmm. And that makes it extremely difficult to spot your target. Right. Hmm. So final point then, and this is a point that you love to talk about. So hopefully you'll, oh, you'll, okay. just, you'll be all over it. <laughs> The sighting system is something that you've addressed now numerous times as to some sighting systems are superior to others, even, you know, from one iron sight to the next, there are yeah. advantages. When you get into the glass world, obviously not all glass is created equal, but more so let's talk magnification for a minute, because one of the things that I routinely see questions about is, well, 
you know, you're only using an X power optic, whatever that is, right? You're only using a two power. You're only using a four power. You're only using a six power. Why don't you shoot it with a 10 or a 14, 16, 18, nine, whatever power optic um, on like these 500 yard targets? Like if you're really trying to demonstrate the effectiveness of the rifle, like why not maximize, put this giant magnification device, the Hubble telescope on the gun. Well, I mean, you, you don't want to press yourself to go as, as high magnification as possible because low magnification also gives you a lot of situational awareness. And also on the topic of Mirage, you also actually get affected less at low magnifications in a sense that y y you may still, I mean, it's still going to be blurred in a low magnification, but at least it's not entirely unusable of a, of a sight picture, right? But a 10X is sufficient to run out to 800 meters or so if you are just shooting the target. But at the same time, the reason some of those higher magnification uh, settings are useful, and I'm not including, let's say, like if you're shooting a 22 match, 22 guys love dialing their stuff as, as high as possible to shoot at their targets to get micro uh, adjustments off of their 22 at 200 meters. That is a, that is a very unique and specific deployment of those high magnification scopes. I'm talking about generally on, from a duty perspective for a, a military sniper, if he were to go out, that high magnification may not be as advantageous to the shooter but the high magnification is advantageous in a sense that it helps you positively identify your target in a sense that you could use that to double what the spotting scope is doing obviously you don't just use it as a spotting scope because it is valuable to have an extra set of eyes and the spotting scope typically has a wider field of view even though it has a larger magnific magnification and clearer glass uh, less um, chromatic uh, uh, dispersion um, than than your you know tube scope, so there is advantages of using a higher magnification scope, but it is not always for shooting because then, let's say you're shooting a three hundred eight and you're dialed in at thirty two x shooting at a four hundred meter target you fire that shot, that recoil will will kind of drop you off target and it'll take you a while to get back on target. In the meantime, you miss all of the things that are going on. You don't see where you missed or where you hit. Uh, you don't see the effects on the target if you are a military sniper. Uh, you cannot convey any of that follow-on information with your spotter or anyone that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And so that is all information that you would miss out if you have it dialed all the way in. And, and it's, it's hyper important to use the appropriate magnification. And I know there's guys out there who, who have the formula of, you know, like if you do, what is it? They say like, um, what one magnification per hundred that you mm -hmm. go out Some people yeah. say that, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, those are good those were good reference points, but when it comes to it, it really has to draw back and depend on what caliber are you shooting? What engagement distance are you looking at? What are you trying to do with this? How much information are you trying to feed into yourself afterwards? Like with a 22, there is no recoil to it. So it is super easy to hold a 15 pound 22 LR rifle on a 200 meter target and just hammer that thing because your 22 is losing steam at that point. You really need that magnification to see where it's hitting. So it's, it, those are entirely different scenarios that you can't just go out there and say, well, you should use X magnification if you're shooting at this distance. There's a lot more that goes into it than, than just that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So I think that that generally covers like the main areas that I wanted to talk about with respect to the, the why you miss subject, you know, it, it, I, and I think we outlined it pretty well. If, if I can summarize it in like a very short pocket, 
the why you miss is answered by a few things. It's possibly mechanical accuracy of the firearm, but that's dictated by the size of target you're trying to shoot. If you're trying to shoot like a torso size target, pretty much all of the service rifles out there from everything going back to the early 1900s is going to be mechanically sufficient to probably hit those targets out to five to 600 yards on a full torso. When you look at additional areas, you're looking at things like your familiarity with the system and your overall skills and fundamentals of shooting. Both of those critically important, but once you have them, generally not going to be something that, that routinely slips away from you. Most of the time, if you've got a, a fairly decent baseline level understanding of, of fundamentals and you have some experience on the platform, probably not going to be one of the main reasons you're missing. When you get past that type of stuff and you get into things like can't call where the hits and the misses are. Yeah, that's really hard to be able to correct when you don't know where the miss is taking place. And when you're looking at things like wind as a main contributing factor, I think that that probably ranks up darn near the top with the caveat around the whole thing being your sighting system can obviously aid you dramatically in your ability to both aim precisely and sort of see what's happening downrange, but you have to know how to use it effectively, whether that's irons or an optic, as we just covered in terms of like over dialing and things of that nature. So with all that said, I mean, Henry, one of the things we wanted to sort of talk through was both our favorite moments from the last year and our most exciting upcomings. I know you teased some of that already, but we've got, you know, a little bit left in the session. Do you want to cover off like best moments from 2023? <clears throat> some of, um, or 2022 rather, man, I am yeah. way ahead of myself. <laughs> so I think, I think some of, some of my favorite or a few of my favorite rifles or videos that we worked with would be the ones that involve um, us learning about the doctrinal use of the firearm. You know, it's 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 one thing just looking at the features, but really reaching back and figuring out, you know, why did they employ these things? So um, I'm going to give a shout out to Ian over at Forgotten Weapons for loaning us his FRF2. Uh, to me, that was... A, a very fun rifle to shoot. I really enjoyed shooting it. Um, and honestly, learning about the French employment uh, and, and the French doctrine and sniper and, and their use of snipers. Um, I would say another video that we experimented with, but uh, I know if we do any more and I would like to do more is going to take a lot of time would be the Royal Hong Kong police episode. Um, specifically, I, I think it's that, that takes it further, right? Because you're not just focusing on the firearm and, and some of the things that develop into the features of the firearm, you, you're focusing on the organization that's using the firearm, um, and how the, the firearms were used, why they were used and historically, you know, seeing the lineage draw out of an organization and the firearms that they used, that was an interesting thing to me. I mean, obviously, being from Hong Kong, growing around the Royal Hong, growing up around the Royal Hong Kong Police, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's more than a fair bit of nostalgia as I work through that particular episode. Um, but I mean, I've been trying to lay the groundwork for some more of that, but it takes time to get a lot of those pieces together. I mean, you know, Josh, I've, it, it took me a while to really put the Royal Hong Kong police arsenal together. And so, yeah, never mind do the research and actually do the <laughs> filming and the production of the content, but like just to curate the required elements. Yeah. So, so I, I do have plans for more of that. Uh, if I were to really let any of it out like what ideas i have maybe i'm trying to read 
German manuals. <laughs> the Deutschland. <laughs> yeah. So we've got some uh, uh, we've got some some plans on uh, both. Uh, let's say the fragmented Deutschland that we'd like to look into. Yeah. Um, I think that was in to me that was that split in east and west germany was interesting because um uh, the history of germany it was is interesting be to begin with because germany is not a country uh until very recent th days and i mean prior to the republic of germany i mean you had prussia you had bavaria you had um uh, Baden Wittenberg. Well, you had all sorts of small kingdoms that all spoke German. But at some, what was it from the 18, late 1800s that uh, the Republic of Germany came together? Uh, and oh, did it come together? Um, <laughs> but then during the Cold War, um, fracturing Germany and then some of the historical development uh, since then and the survival of the Germans as one country is to me is an, is an interesting uh, little bit of history to research. And honestly, the cold war history of Germany is some of my favorite pieces to, to read about and learn about. So on, on my end of the spectrum from this last year, the introduction of the Speedway series was probably the most exciting thing because it, it really bridged the gap into the the shooting that I'm more familiar with where everything's on the clock, right? Uh, and the very unique element of trying to shoot long range on the clock, which does, in, does exist in 3-Gun, and it obviously also does exist in the PRS world, uh, I find particularly exciting to try to take guns that are not optimized to do that stuff the way that I'm used to having them optimized and seeing us try to put them through that type of a course or an environment, particularly challenging and very interesting to watch everything from something like the Mark 12, which is just, it's like almost purpose built for that exact environment through to something like, I mean, the M24 or the FRF2 or shoot like a stock M16A2 was all extremely interesting to, to watch how well you were able to uh, perform with some of those. Now, if I were to do any spoilers, I agree with Josh. That whole segment, I was, I mean, Josh, you know, I was stoked to see it getting rolled out. Um, and some of the ones that really, I don't want to say annoys Josh, but every now and then I bring up guns that Josh is just like, dude, this is just going to not do extremely well. But then I'm telling Josh, like, that's that's the point. That's the point of it is because I want to know. I Henry's, want to work. Henry's just a troll. <laughs> just a troll at heart. Like, no, to, to me, the interesting thing of, of seeing this is uh, were some of the comp lock weapons uh, and how they performed. Yeah. And quite frankly, it surprised me when some of the some of the rifles that were developed specifically for that role performed worse than the ones that were pressed into that role. Uh-huh. Very so, interesting. So that that to me was very, very interesting. And the upcoming the next so I'm working on a classic right now that's called the um the SVDs we have at home. Um, and so, so that's, that kind of encapsulates some of the, um, uh, some of the topics that we've, or some of the specimens that we've worked on speedway, but speedway is hard. That is not easy. Uh, I mean, cause practical accuracy, we're still just chilling, figuring out what's going on. No, you're on your own on speedway and you have to make it. I mean, it's. It's what you're used to in the competition sphere. It's interesting. It makes it it makes it very different uh, within the confines of shooting at distance when you apply that time constraint to it. A um, couple super chats in. Let me see. 
All right, my kind of guy. Thank you, Dom. He's contributing to the 7.7 Arasaka fund. Uh, I actually recently bought a second Type 99. It's sort of a rescue Type 99. Uh, but the, I, I'd like to see if we could slip an Arasaka onto um, onto more you know more screen time at some point. But of course. Man, I got a, I got like a million different screenshots of the Arasaka video that we made. Uh, yes, I mean to be honest, that was the best part about that entire episode. The intro was uh, pretty banging. Oh man, that uh, that trap techno, yeah, it was it pretty was slamming. Yes. Thanks, Dom. So, uh, yep, we'll be in touch as far as the sharps go. Let's see. There was so there was a there was one well, there was one comment up there that we missed, uh, but she's since written back again on a different topic. But Angel of Verdun, she she also mentioned something up top that a bad zero is something that could mm. affect whether you you're hit or not. And so uh, earlier on in our time doing practical accuracy, I would just bring rifles out to the range. And we would like see if it could get on target. I mean, I know at the core we know that's just not going to work, but you know we're just trying to we're just trying to like shoot through all, this whole list of things. And so what we found is off camera, I end up taking a lot of those uh, rifles that we take on loan, and we zero all of them, paper check all of the targets before we go out to the range, make sure that the ammunition and the rifle and the optics all correlate before we even go into the range. And I feel like that's that's gotten way more productive. So that's mm -hmm. probably the bad zero point is probably something that we should add to that short list that you had earlier. Yeah. Um, but something that's because we've eliminated through prep work that we don't see nearly as often nowadays. So... Uh, let me see. AK4 Speedway that is coming. That is coming. Filmed, right? A version is filmed. This is before we got the PLXC that was filmed. Ah. And you remember recently I put together. I found out that the PLXC has a version of the reticle that corresponds precisely with the M80 ball, which is what the AK4 d shoots and mm -hmm. so i'd like to see how that does but it, it's a performer it's a performer for sure the ak4 if we were to use this to to stretch into a topic that could take a long time to discuss the foul versus g3 topic we've actually filmed some fouls as well not just some but full mbell uh slr the British L1A1, the L1A1 Plus Trilux Suit L2A2 scope. And also, of course, in the past, we have the DSA copy of the foul and the foul paratrooper. So we've had multiple fouls. You know, just some of them haven't been published yet. Overwhelmingly, it, to me at least, it seems like even though the PTRs are copies of the G3, it seems to just like wipe the deck with all the fouls on the accuracy realm. I I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I mean, it, it, we've shot a lot of fouls at this point. I still think that they're decent weapons for their era, but I just could not get any accuracy out of them. But I know DSA actually, they 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 very famously published and put together a, a, one of their models that they say is one MOA a DSA. If you're out there and you're willing to loan it to us, I'm happy to see if that thing could clear the course. But I'm wondering if the foul kind of runs up on the M14 syndrome to where it's just exceedingly difficult to accurize, whereas the G3 is just plug and play and the core weapon system is just has accuracy on it and, and could work. So the AK four, 
being something that was pretty cheap to put together, like relatively cheap. Like if you if you compare that to a scar by battle rifle standards, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like if you compare that to a scar, right? Your mm -hmm. PTR all put together is like half the price of a scar. Like a PTR mm -hmm. with optic is like half the price, maybe more than half than a but scar. But it's still less than the stock scar. scar. Yeah. 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 It's significantly less than a stock iron sight, nothing attached, star 17. Yeah. And so I think the value proposition of the AK4 slash G3 is absolutely there when you put that into perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. You know, what was, in, what was interesting is... Um... Oh, look at these comments. I'm telling you, like... Oh, the foul, about... the, the foul comments. What did a foul oh, touch? Oh, no. Once? Um... <laughs> How bad does the PTR? Oh, it, it, it eats brass. Yes. <laughs> I do not reload anything that comes out of the PTR. <laughs> for MOA, for a Stalas, for a Fallas standard. I think I'm seeing like three and a half, but I mean, three, it's like three and a half to four is kind of like. Uh, yeah, I'd say that's that aligns with sort of what we've seen. Well, and and we're we talking about like multiple it. models. Imbel on Imbel receiver and not gone through mass production, but having a gunsmith specifically put everything together and meticulously make sure that everything's okay. SLR, using the original SLR barrel, and the para, using the original para barrel. Like, all of these are original barrels to it. Original bolt, all headspace properly. Three and a half to four. I mean... I, it's just, I mean, that was a standard back then, though. Sorry. Fa oh, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, if you cope, if you have to cope, then. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, I am deeply entrenched into the roller delay gang. <laughs> I now have. Do I have more roller delayed rifles than I do like conventional like long stroke or short stroke piston rifles? I think I may actually. I think I may actually have, have more roller delays than short strokes. Keep keep this one in mind because, you know, I think Instagram boys have seen uh yeah, the Instagram boys right. know. Yeah. Yep. Let's see. Yep. H HK417. Ah, I've thought about a 417. You know, I mean, but it's it's sort of like it, the scar at least has more aftermarket support, I feel like. Um, I feel like the scar has more aftermarket support. The HK417, I mean, absolutely, I'm not saying it's a bad rifle per se, but um it very much is like um it lives it's in a it's a, its own universe more so than than the scar from like using the magazines i think they they changed to using m locks they don't use the reverse key mod the hk has the reverse key mod type of attachments back then i think it's they, they call it like hk mod um I, I don't have any experience on a 417. The CSAS came out after I left. I don't know. Why why not just get a 417, Josh? I don't know. You know I'm a scar boy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, H&K, there is a definitive divide um, between Cold War H&K and post Cold War H and K, I will say, like Cold War H and K, you're talking about HK thirty three, the five five six H and K, mm -hmm. the um, G three, the MP five, like that's definitive Cold War H and K. And then you've got nineties during the sort of the transition when you got the UMPs, G thirty sixes, USPs, which USP is <laughs> one of my faves. Um, but then I'd say sort of progressing from the nineties out, out of the nineties, 
basically a lot of the things i mean and and this is this is known they basically took the g36 gas system and transplanted it on, onto um an ar15 and turning it into the hk416 and then scaled it up to turn it into the 417 um unfortunately it uses proprietary magazines and i know that's a source of anguish to a lot of people um but to the shooters out there, I mean, it is such a different experience going from the 417 era HK to the G36 era HK and back into the roller delayed era HK because you're talking about the roller delayed stuff. Like G3 magazines are like $7 a pop. Like I know guys who have closets full of those things. Yeah. And it costs less than like a basic load for a 417. And then these things were used in Africa, the Middle East. You see them with their stocks hacked off. And that Cold War image of the H&K stuff was... It wasn't always just the... uh, I hesitate in saying this. It wasn't always just that good guy image because it was most certainly seen in the hands of some questionable people um, (laughs) out there. And so there is, there's a really interesting, like if you're if you're an Asian K fan, there's a really interesting um, uh, uh, storyline that you follow. You know, when it comes to the roller delayed system, which by the way was discovered. I'm not just going to say it was designed. Discovered by the um, a lot of engineers that ended up in Spain and Argentina in the fifties. If, if you're, if you're catching what I'm putting down, <clears throat> it, it was a, um, what happened in Argentina in the fifties, Henry, it had a large German population immigrating there, obviously for the lovely ladies and the warm beaches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so this, it's interesting seeing that technology shift, um, in, in H and K and the, and the corporate, the corporate makeup and and a lot. Okay. That mm. please don't tie those two together. I know it sounds like it's tied, but you know, it, it, it's not, I swear they H and K technically came from, what were they making? They were making uh, like typewriters, I believe. Like they were making some, some civil items before they jumped back into making guns. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, the H and K's, the H and K's uh, lineage to me is, is, absolutely fascinating especially when you couple it to my obsession with uh, cold war german history and h and k takes the front and center bit of it anyways sorry that was a huge tangent off of one particular comment about why not hk417 i'm not saying no it's just a little different from from the era that i am hyper focused on yeah all right, so we are running up on time here, Henry. Any final thoughts for the followers who have been kind enough to tune in for this evening? Uh, so I would say this: uh, we do have a lot of stuff that we we're laying on to work on right now. We have a lot of stuff that's going through post production. Um, there is going to be more roller delayed stuff. I know right here, look at this. Uh, Someone was talking about the PSA Jackal. We do actually have an interest in talking about a particular PSA product, but not the Jackal. Um, And that needs a little bit more thoughts though on on that. Uh, But just to throw it out there, some of the things that, that we've had filmed, if I were to, throw it out there for everyone to look at, to, to think about and to get excited about the L1A1 and the fouls. We talked about that. Um, I've been acquiring a lot of pistols and trying to talk about some of their history and employment from the law enforcement perspective, um, mainly European side. Um, the PSL is coming up. Uh, at heavy request 
from the internet. But I don't think they are going to be exactly thrilled at seeing some of the reviews that we're putting down. And I've owned three PSLs, which this third one I reluctantly bought myself specifically because we had so many requests on on uh, reviewing a PSL. But I still did I, I gave it a, a good a good go at the at the course. Um, but that is coming. Um, let's see AK12 we do have I feel like the AK12 I feel bad for the AK12 is what I feel. Um, I had a lot of high hopes for the AK-12 as someone who appreciates the Kalashnikov design and mentality behind it. Um, it just wasn't, it just wasn't there for the yep. AK-12. Uh, so we do have some AK-12, more AK-12 stuff that we have um, filmed. Let me see. I mean, what else do we have on here? We are surprisingly lacking on some sig stuff like new sig we have some old sig a lot of old, old sig but we are surprisingly lacking on the new sig i mean partially partially i've kind of withdrawn back a little bit on the new sig uh to see to want to see how it how it actually does mm -hmm. in the rollout yeah um i mean my gut feeling on this is that uh I don't. I don't necessarily know if this is a really good solution as a general um, rollout. Um, but I mean, it, it, I'm always hesitant on looking at a mass caliber change. Um, you know, I like the 5.7 stuff. I like the P90, but at the same time, I knew that any type of comment saying that the military should adopt the, the 5.7 or whatever, when you mass adopt a, a cartridge along that scale, it takes a lot of resources to get rid of what you have on the old stock, but then also implement what you have coming up. So I'm hesitant in saying, you know, what exactly would happen with the XM5 program, the XM5 project, I'm kind of curious if that juice that they were trying to go for is worth the squeeze. My gut feeling is that it, it is not. Um, but I mean, I'm I'm not. I can't be certain on the um, on the sig, which is why I hesitated on making any type of comment on the sig, uh, the sig spear, uh, specifically the XM5. But um, yeah, so uh, looking at some handgun stuff, yes. And uh, I don't know what else do we have that's exciting uh, on the on the pipeline. There's there's too many to talk about. You've just talked about a hundred different guns that are all in the pipeline in the course of the last thirty minutes. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're staying busy. We're 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 out filming what tomorrow day after. We're out filming yeah. in two days getting back into it now that the cold weather is like sort of arrived here Ooh, in Texas. It's, it's nice. And it's, it's uh, actually nice weather. I mean, it, it is, it is nice. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, listen, gang, I think we're probably going to have one more video drop this, uh, this side of Christmas or maybe right around Christmas time. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, we, we hope you guys all enjoy the holiday, uh, enjoy the holidays here coming up, spend some time with your families, your friends, and uh, we will catch you guys going into the new year. See you on the range. Okay, I need to put that end screen up because I obviously did not have it pulled up. But now <laughs> we will see you on the range. Bye bye. Five one six is Joe Knight six four Vic eight Pat Redcon one Green to Green. Top copy over. Joe Knight six. This is five one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one Pat. Green, green, over. 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 Over.